Greetings, Hussar. Titus Nara van Jacobin, your lord and emperor here at the Jacobin Empire. And once again, welcome to the world of darkness. Yes, we are continuing our dips of diving into Werewolf the Apocalypse, the world of darkness. And today, this spookiest and spookiest of seasons, in this October, we're going to be diving into the fall. Now, I'm not going to be going into super into depths to all of them. Most of these, we only have bits and pieces and chunks of information that I can kind of chat about. And there are bits in here and there that you can go into, but there are a few that you could learn a lot more about. And we'll just be going over the basics, revisiting them in the future. Be very well might. But for now, let's do what we always do and talk about the various books, that if you wish to do more research yourself, you can. And I always would recommend things like the White Wolf Wikipedia online and a couple other online sources if you just want to Google them yourself. But books usually are best for the most detailed information. So, books I could recommend? Well, let's, see. Well, let's start with, of course, the Changing Breeds book. It's the very obvious one here, because it probably is tells you a lot about the Darius Terra, and of course their followers. We have the Apocalypse book, Time of Judgment here. Uh, it involves some of the uh, ones that does mention them and give you some basic information. A World of Rage. Now, for the million versions of this one book, uh, The Book of the Worm, second edition. The Mind's Eye Theater, uh, oh, I should show you this one. The Mind's Eye Theater version of the Book of the Worm. Yes, Mind's Eye Theater introduces lore because it's technically part of the entire thing and you should consider it and don't ignore Mind's Eye Theater. It's there too. So don't worry about it. Much. So consider that one. Book of the Worm, first edition, and the image I'll have up probably most of the time here. Book of the Wor Worm, W20. I do have a couple of other images we'll show off for a few of these, but we'll use this as our background for now, the Book of the Worm. Well, that's only our start here. These books here will give you an idea, and the Book of the Worm books are probably your best bet for most of these and most of the information. And granted, yeah, I would say that the one I'm showing off here, the W20, version of it is the best, but again, between editions, information is sometimes shared, used, not so much, it's kind of a crapshoot. Now, I'm going to also preference this, it did take me a little bit to research all these, because there isn't a very good list online for research, and I did find one on Onyx Path, um, one of their forums, somebody who had been working with a number of people, kind of compiling a list. And there are a couple of names from that list that I was unable to find some basic information on very easily. So we'll kind of just say that they are there, and I'll basically mention them. That's the best I can say. So here's one that we're going to start with, which is not in any of these books. See, that's the entire thing, is what I'm going to start with is actually something from... Onyx Path's website. Onyx Path introduced us to the fallen Ajiba. So, I haven't talked about the Ajiba yet in my Changing Grief Guide. And Ajiba are, of course, the Werehinders. I'll talk about them in the future. But we know them from the Onyx Path website, and, um, you know, it was a request from the forums that they talk about them, the Ozuzo. Um, so, yes. It's the idea that, um, the Ozuzo fell to the worm. You know, 
it was the Ajaba and it had, you know, weakness. Um, and the Called Worm grabbed them and turned their weakness into strength. Um, sacrificing their small, some, some strongest trait, admitting defeat to the worm. And they gave it false strength, power to lead it into darkness. It learned how to steal the strength from fallen foes, exuding alluring uh, charisma to draw those of were hyena blood to them. Uh, and at first it killed the strong over the weak. It used strength that isn't theirs as its own weakness. An uh, fallen Ajiba and Oz Zuzo um, grow stronger by feasting on the souls of their opponents. Murdering the strongest um, empowers them. And, but in a pinch, anyone will do. So. Yep. That's the basics of them. And, uh, yeah. I can actually say here, and I, I'll actually link this here because I have Twitch chat below me. So I'll try to remember maybe to put this into the uh, this is the website there. Uh, it's the the hidden rain, um, and this talks about the Ozuzu. So this is this is the one that I can kind of give out here a little bit different from the rest. Thanks, Onyx Path. Onyx Path. Now, for the Anasi, we kind of go alphabetically through there. There are actually two groups to talk about. The um, An Antara, also known as the Breakers, and the Kuma. They're very different than each other, but kind of a little bit. Like, the Kuma I talked about when I talked about the Anasi. That they are, you know, the goblin spiders uh, from Asia that... They're considered traitors by the Ananasi of the West, um, but they still have their place in the web. Um, and, yeah. And that's the thing about it, is I did talk about it a little bit. I mentioned it, and, you know, they're one of the ones that are technically with the worm, and the Ananasi are kind of on this edge when it comes to the worm, the wild, the weaver. So they're really in this odd spot. The ones that I really want to mention out of this group are the ones that I call the Breakers, the Antara. They are an actual group that truly fell to the worm. As much as the Kumo serve the worm, but you can talk about how they may not fall to the worm, which I'll throw an image of a Kumo up here. That's a Kumo. Um, there, hello. Um, the... And Tara, on the other hand, you know, walked the queen's web, uh, followed the strands to list tra uh, her trap for what is. They didn't want to be ensnared. They went to the worm for power and broke free of the webs. Um, Basically, each Anasi has their place in the web, and these didn't want to have their place in the web, so they went to the worm. The Hatar followed the worm's original purpose. The Antara followed the worm into freedom. They believe that the queen uses Anasi for her own goals, not at Gaius. They understand corruption is inevitable. Everything must fall. Entropy is unceasing. Um... Even the most debased and degraded can erode farther. They see freedom in the madness of the worm. In standing on a cosmic sail. So they break free of their queen's machinations and uh, experience everything life has to offer before the worm takes it. That's the idea. They want to... They're hedonists. Um, they revel in release spontaneous, irrational ways. They don't seek ki uh, kinship with the Kumo. And their irrational behavior can be kind of seen as alien to a lot of anas an anas. So the Kumo still... They serve the worm, but they see that kind of balance between the new and the old. I talked about that. While these here are just 
the madness. This is this is deeper than everything. So that is them. And their existence are solitary. They can sometimes work with others, maybe other Ananasi, um, but they do not go for anyone giving them con uh, con instructions or controlling their actions. Um, for a breaker to follow another's will requires, or another, just in general, follows incredible strength of will because basically they wish to murder them on transgressor who's trying to force them to do anything they wish not to do. And they will follow if they believe it will further their own goals. The Mind's Eye Theater book, uh, Book of Worm, was when they referred to as Breakers, and the W20 book is where they got the term and heart. So that is the Anasi Fallen Fair. We'll go back to this is a book over here until we get to. Hmm, I got one more to talk about in that one. Now, one that was in the uh, World of Rage, Players Got Changing Breeds, or mentioned in the Apocalypse book that I showed, is the Hellcats. They are what's left of the Sicilian Bassettes in Scotland. And um, I, I talked a little bit about them when I talked about Bassett, but basically they are a surviving group of Bassett that were basically turned to the worm. Their entire group was kind of driven to madness, uh, self-destructing, mindless aggression, and, and most of them were murdered. Those that remain are the Hellcats. Um, and uh, they're bringing their potent links to the gifts of the Fae and various worm fetishes constructed with the set like curiosity. So, Hellcats are just mad. But they are the fallen the set. Of course, we can talk about a changing breed, which I haven't discussed in my full episodes yet. The uh, Camazots, who are theoretically extinct, but theoretically also those that fell may still exist. In a way. It's the Zebalon. The Kamazots are the werebats. The Zebalon are those that dedicated themselves to the worm through the taint of the their pat aspect, patron the bat. The bat was tainted, destroyed, and it all led to their destructions. The Kamazot have disappeared. But the Zebalon, their kinfolk called blood bats, do haunt South American rainforests. Kinfolk, there could be Zebulon. They cropped up in every Kamazot's community around the globe, waxed and waned with the struggle of the bat totem. As uh, the bat fell more and more, they became more powerful, Hint, hounded their guy and brethren as those tried to rescue the bat. As when the bat would gain strength, and those loyal to Gaia and Zebulon shrank. So it was this kind of like battle between the two that took some time. This struggle was hidden from all the other shading breeds. There were most often small cults of Zebulon dedicated to blood magic who fell prey to the whispers of the worm. And as they seek their expand their numbers, they proselytize in secrets, uh, getting the rest of their breed into the worm service. The Camazot of South America, those exterminated in the Second War of Rage, were those that were most resilient to Zebulon's corruption. And with them gone, the fallen whereabouts were strengthened to the point that they joined their totem directly pushing it into the worm's embrace. Fighting the remaining loyal colonies died in open combat. When the bat fell, the Zebulon flew into Mal Malthus to join the worm, and no one has seen them since. Um, Malthus is the mad 
realm of the worm in the deep hunger. Just to note. If I would go into the Deep Umbra and have some lore, more of the lore of the worm and stuff, it's the fact that the Zebulon still may exist in some way, and their kinfolk still exist in some way. But they might be all that's left of the Camasots. They might. The Fallen, which is sad. They are unfortunately aren't the only one. But we'll talk about that. When a Korax, where it falls to the worm, these lost children are buzzards. When a black scar dancer or a worm major discovers the were raven's umbral nest and steals the fetish egg, usually from the dead talons of the guardian, they take the egg back to Malthus. There, the spiritual threads connecting the egg with the raven or human who had grew up to become a Korax begins to fret. The threads snap. If heroic were-ravens can rescue this egg before the connection vanishes, the young Korax gives their first change, has at worst nightmares. Once the connection snapped, the human raven becomes catatonic. Most die. The egg begins to decay, becoming nothing more than an empty shell. But that's not the only fate for the egg. They throw it into a foul birthing pit, along with a stolen human infant. They, for they for form the rite of the broken wing, similar to the rite of the fetish egg, except a mockery of it, that connects the stolen and dying egg to the infant. It's a simple ritual. It requires a right master to shatter uh, systematically every bone in the left wing of a captive bird. They can use any bird but prefer ravens. Or a captive Korax. If the right fails, the egg dissipates, the infant dies. If it succeeds, it binds the two together in a horrible imitation of a young were Final creatures warped beyond belief. A corked buzzard. Or sometimes called scabs. That's how you get a worm-tainted Korax. You take the spiritual essence of one, remove it from its its actual host, and then in a horrible ritual, bind it to another uh, a human infant, um, forcing them to become a horrible monstrosity if they don't die. Yes. That's why we're talking about this in October. Now, a group of which I will honestly discuss on their own, the Black Spiral Dancers. As much as I would love to go into the Black Spiral Dancers, they really deserve time on their own. And it will be something in the future. But for now, we'll give you the basics. They are the werewolves who fell to the worm. Garu, who turned towards them. They've been a long been around they've been around for a long time. Their original origins are said to be back towards the Roman age. But they've been around since then. They organize into sects called hives. The Karens they raise their young are called pits. Black spirals lived amongst the foul, cancerous children of the worm for centuries. They are corrupted to the core. There's more to all this. More to the story of the Black Spiral. But again, they really do deserve something of their own bit in the story. Something of a full dive into what they came of. Let's move on. Because 
We have one that was introduced in the Mind's Eye Theater, Book of the Worm. That we can talk about. Of course, what happens when a Grul, a werebear, falls to the worm? We haven't talked about them in the main episodes yet, the changing breeds. But they're called Purgers. Uh, a good quote from the book. From the Book of the Worm, Mind's Eye Theaters. Purgers hear the world scream in pain. Their long sleep was haunted by it. Now it's time for a new beginning. Now it's time for the world to be purged of all so that may be reborn from the ashes. Basically, the Gruhal went into hibernation, sleep, to escape the War of Rage. Some went to sleep already enraged by what the Garo were doing. Purgers had that rage consumed. They dreamed of atrocity after atrocity, watched what the Garo per uh, perpetrated. To ignore or be ineffective against the destruction, nature, the rape of the land, as they say. That anger corrupted their souls until it was all they could remember. And they woke, ready to destroy the world in order to cleanse it. Convinced that no living being is worthy of saving. If it's destroyed, they can be born again. So they must kill everything in order for the world to be reborn to Gaia's original intentions. It's too far for Gaia's intentions. We just gotta destroy everything. So they work about to bring the basically apocalypse, the fires of it, to burn everything down so the world can be born again. They use the right of tainting uh, to force other changers away from their cairns uh, and other pure lands. They work to taint food supplies, water, and air to purge human population. Normally they're working alone, but they can work with others for common goals. When they're not uh, behind the scenes spreading poisons, they delight in killing sprees. There you go. Urgers. They're very pleasant. Ah. So the Kitsina have the Koku, but I can't tell you a lot about them, because I could only see that reference for their name. And um, my morning of research didn't get me any extra. But I'll mention the name. There's a couple like that that I can mention that. Uh, like the Beset have the Hishtpa, but I don't know much about them, and I can't say much about them. But we can talk about the following. Moku. In the Mind's Eye Theater book, they were known as uh, Dumenkara. But in the, the, the W20 book of the words, they're known as Mimetics. Eater of secrets. Mokle guarded Gaia's memory. Witnessing history. But they are not naive enough to hope that other... Changing breeds learn from the mistakes and use the knowledge to avoid tragic path. The Mokale had once hoped the young breeds in the age past would take their heed and knowledge and use it. But the mistakes of menses of memory, repeated over and over again, demonstrate a futility. So the Mokale watch the dying world around them and wait for the next apocalypse. Menetics are those that basically see the futility in their attempts to teach history, to guard that memory. It's not worthy. So, an interesting little group there. We can go farther, though, into the Nuisha. Noesha is another one I haven't dove into. It's the Were Tigers. But they have a fallen villa known as Nokomi, or the Bitter Grins. It's 
So, it's wanting to see the conclusion of the greatest prank of all. The worm looked at the balance between the triad and saw the siblings took the balance for granted. With a bitter grin, the worm decided to prank to teach the siblings the value of what they had. Spoke to the weaver, teased her that the wild had uh, great dominance over Gaia. Though this was untrue, and the forces were balanced, the weaver listened, grew jealous of the siblings. Um, eventually, the weaver placed order. The wild crept, th uh, crept through, this, uh, desecrating the fixed structure with teeming life and chaos. The weaver did not see the worm conspiring with the wild to subvert order and break cohesion. They nipped its structures to make cracks in which the wild energy could, uh, could help it spring through. Enraged by the inequality, the weaver desperately covered dynamic wild with static forms with little success. Wild kept breaking through. Weaver lamented to the worm, and worm grinned in an act in the second part of his plan. He emphasized with the weaver, uh, empathized with the weaver, but conceded he had to obey his nature and weaken the order she imposed in the world. The weaver snapped. An active plans to ensnare the worm in her webs and defeat the wild. This was the worm's plan all along. Trapped within the weaver's webs, the worm was able to alter its nature. Shut something it couldn't achieve with balance. It whispered to itself in the darkness and changed, gaining dominion over corruption if it can. The worm degraded the weaver's bonds. Free of the bonds, it was able to affect the demeanor of the force gone mad, and the worm threw itself into its role, corrupting and perverting everything that once had balance. That's what Nokomi knew. The worm can't be defeated because the worm isn't really fighting. It's playing a prank on everyone and everything, and any action besides complete surrender is pointless. The weaver is too stubborn and uh, stolid in his ways to learn the prank, and the wild is too capricious and fickle to comprehend the lesson it is offered. The fallen Numishua understand the joke better than anybody itself, even old Coyote. They know that Worm fell victim to its own prank. That's the funniest joke of all, to fall victim to your own prank. All did was want to teach its siblings. But its new nature has corrupt or twisted that vision. Now the Worm drags everything to oblivion because it can't stop the decay any more than the Weaver can loosen up or the Wild can settle down. And that's the bitter grits. An interesting little story that explains the fall of the Nkami. Let's talk about the fallen Rat King. Referred to as Vermin in the Book of the Worm, the original one, and uh, the Mad Destroyers in the W20. So, the Mad Destroyers, fallen Rat King. The worm's insane hates the weaver for ensnaring it in her web. Its madness and loathing of the weaver gave common cause, at least with some were-rats. Were-rats are prone to madness, and many of them consider the weaver to be an even greater threat than the worm. Rulers of most rat king nests wish to build their numbers before they strike at humanity are content that the apocalypse will arrive soon enough. But a few were-rats are tired of waiting. They glory in the idea of watching the entire world burn. Uh, or they fixate them plans to destroy humanity something like, uh, and sometimes find like-minded allies among the legions of the worm. I I'm gonna butcher this one here because this is worm stuff, uh, and it is, uh, it is names. Uh, Thurifurge, the, uh, or Thurifudge, Thurifudge? Oh. The Malgin and Karna. Uh, of uh, the worm and of disease, Malgin and Karna being the basically powerful servants of, uh, of the worm, their veins, they inhabit Malfeast, which I talked about today, so they're basically incarnations of the dark, corrupted spirits of the worm. Anyway, um, takes most interesting recruiting Ratkin. Um, he finds work for most of them is Duchy and Malfus. They create even more deadly plagues. He does assign some of them work at Pentex Medical Research Facilities back on Earth. 
But yes, it's the idea that Ratkin are very hostile towards humanity in general. They're like, ah, the Apocalypse will take care of them. We'll talk about Ratkin in the future. The were-rats. And some just join the worm to speed it up. Now we can talk about the Roki that have fallen to the worm. We got that there as some Garor fighting a Balefire shark. A worm tainted, or, or uh, a were shark tainted by the worm. Many were created after Rokio were victims to a nuclear explosion in 1955. They took lethal dose of radiations but didn't die uh, immediately. Pentacle beings of Lord Kearney, master of Balefire, approached them and offered them a chance of survival by embracing the radiation that was killing them. Only a handful accepted the offer. But those few, mad and, and uh, by the pain and fear, swore allegiance to the worm. Um, knowing that the same force that was killing them, they asked for their loyalty, basically. Balefire elementals aided these were sharks, healed them, warped and twisted them in the process. They bear the marks in or of their ordeal and transformation. Terrible scars. Warp features, like additional eyes and fins, malformed body parts, grew back, twisted, when they healed from the bomb blast. They pledged loyalty to the worm, and because Gaia charged were sharks to survive, not to fight the worm. Very few had few very few had any regrets about the alliance. They're like, well, you know, I wasn't told to fight you, and I just survived, which was my order from Gaia. Okay, we're good. Um so they patrol polluted waters around nuclear power plants and factories producing toxic chemicals, keeping them safe from land or sea that would interfere in their operations. They can exist in both fresh and salt water, as long as the water is radioactive polluted. They patrol the areas of the Great Lakes, Lake Baikal, Caption Sea, and some of the bodies of water. Since the 1950s, they've learned more about the land, so they can protect factories and power plants better. Instead of protecting nuclear sites, though, from interference, most destroy reactors, rip open, uh, rip open reactor waste dumps, and spread the poison in large areas. There are insane balefire uh, sharks that sometimes uh, are a little too destructive for the worm's subtle agents. Uh, um, so on a few occasions, agents of worms have found ways to pass messages to either Rokia or members of Changing Weeds to basically encourage them to get rid of the Balefire Shark and its indiscriminate destruction. Um, because they get in the way of the Worm's actual plans. Uh, the W20 book is the one I would recommend looking into that. But we have one more Fallen Pharah to talk about today, and it's probably one of the more sad ones as I've talked about a few of them. I talked about the Kamazots, the Werebats, how, yeah, they fell, but some of them fell to the worm. Well, the unfortunate thing is there is a changing breed that is gone, except for their kin, who have been corrupted by the worm. The Skullpig. Skullpigs. They were created by Grondorkin. Grondar were the werewolves. They're extinct. I'll perhaps talk about them in the future a little bit, but... Before I do, their kin turned to the surface of the worm in order to survive the war bridge. Basically, what was left of Grondor blood. The possibility for perhaps showing up again. Turned it. They're degenerate creatures that feast on carrying garbage and toxic waste. They mimic the gifts of their Grondor ancestors. Their flesh is highly poisonous. They lost the ability to, regions, uh, to reason. But some can gain intelligence by consuming the bones of worm-tainted creatures. And those that gain their intellect are able to use tainted mystical powers, mirroring the shadow magic of the sect, and they're called Voodoo pigs.
They are remnants of the Grondo. Their fate was created by the werewolves. Werewolves slaughtering the Grondor in the War of Rage created these monsters. And that's, uh, all the fallen ferret talk about today. As I said, I will talk deeper about Black Spiral Dances. They really do deserve their own episode in all of this. They, they deserve their own dive a little deeper into everything about them. But that's the thing is the worm is corruption. What it existed with in the concept of the werewolf the apocalypse metaphysics and stuff it was balanced with the others. There was a reason behind it. But with whatever happened, whatever story you believe, whatever story the changing group believes, it has become ultimately corrupted. To a point that is pretty terrible. And this corruption spread to all of its spirits, things, its realm, and to those that serve it now. You notice a lot of the stories are very corrupted, wicked, terrible, murderous. These aren't great creatures. Fallen Pharaoh are monsters. You can call a werewolf a monster. You can call plenty of things in the world of darkness monsters. But those that have begun to follow the worm, they truly become monsters. Embracing the worst of it. Their fall marks pain and suffering for so many. And marks a corruption, a debasement, a malfeasance of everything they once stood for. For everything their kind is done. And it will continue. As long as they exist and along with the war, with the worm continue. Because there will always be those that are weak. And that's the thing. Those that are weak of will fall. Those that are in desperate fall. And those that have been abandoned. And that will be it for today. I hope you enjoyed this dive into the fallen pharaoh, those that lost their life and became monsters. There will be more to talk about in the future, definitely. We'll have to hit up Black Spirals. But until then, remember that I do stream this live on Twitch if you want to check it out. Uh, I, you know, I don't join me live, or this goes up on YouTube usually a couple of days later. Our technical issues with trying to upload it. Usually then fully delayed a day or two. If you want to give some support on either of the channels on the Twitch dive, uh, twitch.tv forward slash the Coven Empire, great, and just give a follow there. That's the easiest way. YouTube is a little bit more complex if you're joining them on the YouTube side. A subscription on YouTube, uh, leaving a comment if you've dealt with any of these Fallen Pharah. And honestly, an interesting question. Has any of you ever tried to have it be in a game where it was something that's now worm creatures? Played a Black Spire or some of the other fall. Because there are books that allow for that sort of thing. We'll talk about that in the future. Um, uh, ringing the bell, you know, leaving a like, those are good things on the YouTube side. Um, just to give some engagement. If you do want to check out some uh, more information about what's going on with me, I do have some social media. There is the Discord link and my Twitter.com link. If you're looking for the schedule of things, Usually everything's uploaded on YouTube a few days afterwards, but the current schedule for tabletop stuff, on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday, early afternoon, usually sometime around between 1 and 2 starting, depending on what's going on that day, and Saturday mornings at around 11 o'clock, or noon. 
Saturdays are your World of Darkness day from when joining the World of Darkness. Um, and there's the Pathfinder Galarian day on Thursdays. Um, I do usually some live shows of uh, tabletop currently on one of those that are coming up with new ones in the future. And of course, there's tabletop on Saturdays where you can see us talk about all the tabletop stuff we use the week. And then do some other game streams. That's not why you're here. You're here for tabletop. I mean, okay. I'm going to get going. I think I gave all my shout outs. I hope you enjoyed. Honestly, this deep dive and learning all of that. And I hope in the future you can join me for more. And we'll talk about the last time. But until the next time, into the future, where we bond once more into the world of darkness, I bid all of you out there a farewell.